land, glory land, a place where God and his children stand. Glory land, glory land, a place where God and his children stand. A place where we laugh and have a good time, a place where the love of God it shines, a place where we can learn and grow together. Join all your friends at Glory Land. Come and join all your friends at Glory Land. This is Lisa Barry and Bernice McGill, and this is Prophets Forum. Unfortunately, Stephen Topier will not be with us this evening, but we hope that he'll be joining us soon. Uh, tonight, we're talking about uh, how we react to tragedy uh, and, and uh, really uh, how we react to um, 
huge traumatic events in our life where we we experience sorrow and grief and really what the Lord does and and how he reacts to us experiencing those things here on earth and it's important that we have an understanding of this because many of us have lost family members or loved ones or been through quite traumatic circumstances and Jesus Christ died on the cross for every sickness every sorrow and every sin and God does understand our emotions. He absolutely does. You know, humans respond to, to things in, in, in the world, you know, very physically, of course. But we also respond spiritually. And our souls, our mind and emotions react. And this is what we call, uh, you know, emotional responses. And in fact, uh, the, the fact of the matter is human emotion is one proof that, that God himself has emotions for he created us in his image. And this is spoken of in Genesis 1.27. And so I think it's important that we, we really understand and give ourselves grace to be able to react in, in a healthy way, a spiritual, spiritually uplifting way, despite what we've, get, we've been through. And, and let the Holy Spirit and let the Lord actually heal us as as we go along and and you know bernice welcome it's you know a lot of people have said sometimes when you lose a loved one or have gone through a traumatic event like that it's it's almost like losing an arm or a limb and you know and, and, and you know there's people that will say well you know in time you know you'll get past it but having experienced immediate family members myself who passed away I think uh, those kinds of things you don't get over uh, like that. I mean, your emotions still remember the times that you had with them and the good times. However, God helps us, even if we have a, a limp because we're an amputee, even if we, we've lost a part of ourselves because we love that person, he gives us grace sufficient to be able to walk on. And, uh, and you know, his grace is, is so wonderful through times like these isn't it? Amen. Amen. Yeah, it, it it is. You know, I was just, I was thinking about it just this week as well, just, you know, pre preparing uh, for tonight as well, praying into different things that the Lord was showing. And I think that's, that's the thing. It, I don't think that grief or sorrow um, ever leaves you completely, but I think you can, you can experience those things um, in the grace of God and that it gets easier to, to process particular things or, or, or work through certain situations because God doesn't, you know, when you've had a loved one um, that's maybe passed on, you know, God doesn't want you just to forget, forget their existence so that you can live in a, a life without grief or sorrow. Um, he, he wants you to be able to still have those, those memories and find joy in those places, but without it holding you captive every time um, you experience that grief or you experience that emotion. Ocean. So, you know, it is, it's, it's, a, it's a big topic tonight. I know we often say that on the broadcast, but it feels like a, a complex kind of, um, kind of topic, a sensitive topic as well. So I'm just trusting and I really believe that the Holy Spirit is is here to bring freedom and liberty tonight as well, and just minister to to the viewers as well as you're listening, as 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 revelation is getting released, things that the Lord has has spoken to 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 myself and to you, Lisa. And I just believe that the Holy Spirit's going to just move and actually um, minister to those those wounded places, even though they might seem quite historical. And um, I want to just start really with one scripture, and that is in John sixteen thirty three, which is a well-known passage of scripture, but Jesus is speaking to his disciples and he says, I've told you these things so that in me you might have perfect peace and confidence that in the world you're going to have trouble. Um, and the Amplified kind of extends on that. It says, you know, you're going to have trouble, you're going to have tribulation, you're going to have sorrow, you're going to have trials, you're going to have distress, you're going to have frustration, but take courage, be confident and be certain for I have overcome the world. And I think that's the perspective at which we we come at things, that we're not immune to the things that happen um, in life. We're not immune to tragedies just because we're Christians. Um, but we can we can take such confidence and have such reassurance that Christ overcame the world, that actually he did take our sickness. He did take our sorrows. And that though we might have lots of questions on this side of of eternity, you know, he he is so amazing and that he walks through all those seasons with us. He doesn't leave us to our own devices to try and figure it out and work it all out for ourselves. But actually he walks us through those, those moments that might seem overwhelming, that might bring us to our knees and grief and loss and, and all sorts of questions. So mm -hmm. I just, 
just know God's going to minister to hearts tonight as well. So it's just, yeah, it's good to be on. Amen. Amen. So, you know, something that uh, Bernice, you and I were speaking about just prior to coming on is about regret and, and how regret can, can be a real uh, tool uh, of, you know, of Satan and, and also to uh, really an arrow to our flesh uh, because we we're disappointed uh you know that we feel like there's something we could have done to have changed things you know and and i i believe the enemy really works on that open door you know a regret is something that can really have a, a lever you know it, it can really cause us to be in a perpetual state of regret you know regretful behavior where we're we're, we're feeling that if there's just something would have, we would have done differently things would have been changed it wouldn't have had the same result and and of course you know if it, if it's uh, your mother that passes on you feel like you could have been a better daughter or i and i believe regret doesn't just happen with uh, people loved ones that have died but i think regret uh, you, people grieve even with divorce because that's a traumatic event you know because you feel like that's it's your fault and it could have something different could have been done to have sorted that so it's a type of death as well so the, and that's a, it's a really traumatic event. I think uh, this kind of thing even happens with uh, children that don't keep in contact and they've gone off into to the ways of the world and they don't connect connect with their parents and so it causes regret. The parents think of oh if I just would have said this or would have said that. So there's there's a, this thing regret is something that I think really gets hold of people where they they start having a lot of guilt. And then the, the enemy starts speaking a lot of deception into their minds. But the, the thing we all need to remember is we, we have a free choice. And, and as I mentioned earlier in online church, the Lord's not going to strong arm anyone. Uh, and, and so in regards to uh, children missing, uh, you know, or not wanting to be in contact with their parents or even divorce, it's a, it's a two way street. And, and in regards to loved ones, uh, it serves no purpose. I mean, the, the Lord says that we should reflect on the good, you know, and we should we should actually keep our eyes fixed on him. So if it's going to actually work in line with the enemy who seeks to kill, steal and destroy, then we know what we've opened up the door to the jaws of the enemy. And we, we have to really firmly keep that door shut. And of course, I, I was reading about uh, in Galatians, uh, you know, Paul, it was very, very genuine in his testimony about the regret that he went through. And, uh, you know, he, he talks about how he marvels at the Gospels. And in the first part of chapter one, he talks about all of that. But then he goes on and reflects, starting in verse 11, he reflects about his testimony of becoming an apostle and being called by Jesus. And when he was first called on the road to Damascus, you know, he actually, um, it, it was a supernatural divine event where Jesus said, Paul or Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And, and you know, when he was struck blind, most of us know that story. But what we don't know is that uh, Paul felt a lot of guilt, a lot of regret, because he was absolutely uh, a murderer of Christians. And it took him a long time to really come to terms with that. He went actually to Arabia. And uh, the history that I've read about that, it was about 17 years. He was, you know, he went there a long time to get himself into that place. And then when he came back to Jerusalem, another three years before he even uh, came and, and addressed the leaders uh, of the Christian uh, movement. And so this is a man that was reflective about what, what he had done. And he had a lot of regret. And so there's a process to working through these things. And, and I don't believe God's in a hurry in helping us to get through. I think we have to give ourselves time and we to heal and also to just refer to the word. And really, God wants to restore us in all things. Amen, Bernice? Yeah, amen. Yeah, I mean, even preparing for this, for tonight's broadcast, that was one of the things that the Lord had had brought up where he said to me, um, as I was praying, he said, you know, many are grieving over what they would never had or what should have been, over what they never had and what should have been. And um, I'm always a bit of a stickler for scripture because I'm like, well, where are we in scripture, Lord? Um, and he actually took me into a passage of scripture in 1 Samuel 1, where it's, we know the story of Hannah, 
um, um, before she conceives and gives birth to the prophet Samuel. But it talks about Hannah's deep anguish and how she was crying bitterly before the Lord. And she makes a vow to the Lord and she's crying out to God. And she says this, she says, if you will look upon my sorrow and mm -hmm. answer my prayer and give me a son, then I will give him back to you and he will be yours for his entire lifetime. And the sign will be that he is dedicated to the Lord, that his hair will never be cut. And, you know, we, we, you know, we kind of sometimes we whiz past these biblical stories sometimes and we're just like, OK, she had a problem and God sorted it out and Samuel was born and none of his words fell to the ground. And, you know, it's all kind of all wrapped up very nicely in, in scripture. But she was a woman of sorrow. She had deep sorrow because, you know, she she desperately wanted a child. She, you know, the, the, the shame that was actually connected to her not conceiving, mm -hmm. especially in that culture, would have been huge. And, you know, this is this is where I think a lot of people, like you were saying, have this regret. You look at what should have been. You know, there are people who, you know, will be listening to the broadcast and say, you know, I should be married by now. Or I should have had children by now or I should have been parented better or I should have had a better parent or I should have had this or I should have. You know, and we've got our eyes and that's where the enemy wants us. He wants us fixated on our losses. He wants our eyes actually focused on the problem. He wants us looking backwards instead of actually looking forward and fixing our eyes on Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith, so that we actually keep our hearts postured before the Lord, because the Lord doesn't want us not to feel these things. He doesn't want us to be void of these emotions and not experience these emotions, but he does want us to be able to work through those emotions with him and to be fixated on, on God. What are you saying into the situation? What is your word over this situation? What is your promise over a particular situation, even though things haven't gone according to maybe the plan or haven't worked out, or we felt like we were kind of handed a bad deal uh, in life, the way things kind of turned out and God is saying no just 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 come into that place keep your heart actually postured before me so that you can still receive from God even though you're having to walk through some of the emotion of of loss and lack and and regret and so I, I believe it's just a real ploy of the enemy to have us have us in a place where we can't see what God is saying and we can't see the hope and we can't see the light we can't see kind of the new day new day dawning on us um the, the the Lord even today kept saying to me, it's today. <laughs> and I said, Lord, what do you mean it's today? And he said, today, today. And that's why I have such a the sense on this broadcast that the Lord is really going to heal people um, of those broken, wounded places that people are carrying because the Lord is saying it's today, today. And in Hebrews 3, we know it says that the Holy Spirit says today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as they did in the rebellion, in the day of trial, in the wilderness. And I have that sense of the Lord just declaring over us, you know, it is today that in Hebrews 13, 8, it says that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so we've right. got to be in today. You know, the enemy wants us looking at yesterday and going, look at yesterday, look at all I missed, look at all I all that happened to me, look at the tragedy, look at the strife, look at the grief. And God's saying, No, it's today, and I am the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And so I can heal you in your woundedness today. I can touch you in that place today. You can have an encounter with me, even though it's maybe not the, the completed outcome that you want, even though you might be sort of midway through the journey of processing grief or processing emotions, God says, you can encounter me today because I am alive and living. I'm seated on the throne in heaven over all things, and you can encounter the presence of God. And I love I don't think I actually ever caught it until I, you know, maybe I just looked at it with fresh eyes this week in Hebrews 3, where it says, therefore, the Holy Spirit says, mm -hmm. that's how it starts, is the Holy Spirit says today, if you hear his voice, and it's that sense of the Holy Spirit speaking, that he that he has a voice, that he speaks to you, he gives you direction, um, he encounters you, he comes with words of comfort, he comes with words of edification, he comes with words that just, just make all things better because he has a voice. Um, and I've never, I've never really seen that even in the scriptures before. I was so thankful that I saw it. I was like, yeah, Lord, I missed that. I've missed it. I've read it a thousand times probably, but I'm 
this, that it's the voice of the Holy Spirit that comes in. And in the book of Matthew, it tells us that, you know, the, he will comfort those who mourn. So even where there's mourning, we know Holy Spirit is described, one of his descriptions is the comforter. So, you know, when he comes in, he wants to speak to you. He wants to comfort you. He wants to, he wants to impart things to you. But we have to live in the, in, in the today moment that God wants to encounter me today and not allow the enemy to steal my today because if we if we're allowing the enemy to steal today he's going to steal tomorrow and the next day and the next day if we allow him because our eyes are shifting into the past rather than focused on who Jesus is and what he is actually speaking so you know I just I just say you know let's let you know God if, if, if this is even as we've started to speak you know if this is touching the believers that are listening tonight or unbelievers you know just bring don't bring a hard heart you know it's so easy when you're raw and you're full of sorrow and you're full of grief to just immediately shut off. You just want to close up your heart. You just don't want to hear some of the things that are being spoken or the truth that God is actually releasing. And I think that's an important scripture. Don't harden your heart because hardness of heart really can block the things that God wants to do and work through you. So that's the posture. Say, God, I know it's going to hurt or I know it's uncomfortable or I know this is going to dig up some emotions and feelings that I didn't feel like I had the energy um, or the will to even want to pray. Process, but God just says, just bring me your heart, just bring me that openness, and then allow the Holy Spirit to minister into those places. And that's what He's going to do tonight um, for those who, who do that. You know, I, I it brought to my remembrance, Bernice. I was one time riding on a train, and the Lord wanted me to speak a word of knowledge to to a very well dressed man uh, in it with a briefcase, and uh, the train was absolutely heaving and full. And uh, the word was, was a really significant word about how his mother had prayed over him and that he was running away from his calling. But now that it was time to, to come back to the Lord and align with his calling. And uh, so it seemed like a simple enough word. I wasn't quite sure with a heaving train full of people how he was going to get over there and give that word. But I said, well, Lord, uh, you know, I'm going to trust you to make this happen and the very next stop by uh, west london everybody got off but me and that man <laughs> so i went over there and i i said you know very meekly i said i'm i, I just have a word from you I, the lord speaks to me and and i'm a christian and and may i release that word to you i believe it'll mean something to you and and he, you know his eyes got really big but he he sat down and and i sat beside him and i gave him that word and the man started weeping. And then I soon came to realize he was he was in a lot of pain. And uh, when I released that word to him, uh, he, he I mean, he was literally sobbing. And he and he said to me, you'll never know what that word means to me. And, and he said, my mother and uh, my sister were gunned down in New York City. He was an American man. And this, this was in London that I prophesied to him. And he said, my mother did used to pray over me and tell me I was going to be a great man of God that the Lord had shown her. And he said, after this word today, I will never be the same. And, and he said, do you know who I am? I didn't know who he was. I don't really follow sports, but, uh, you know, but he revealed to me later on, he was a football manager on quite a popular team in the United Kingdom. But, you know, I, I was just absolutely blown away how the Lord went to so much trouble, so much effort to have me, he, all of those people got off. He appointed me at that time just to give that word to that man that was grieving. And, and the Lord was saying, you know, yes, I've seen your sorrow, but now you're going to come into a place of fulfillment. Don't run away. Come back to me. Come back to my arms and I'm going to help you through this grief. And I think this is sometimes what we don't realize. And my uh, my sister-in-law said something quite profound recently. Of course, she very, very sadly uh, lost her daughter. Uh, she was murdered by a pedophile uh, about 30 years ago now. But she, she said something recently on her Facebook page. And she said, I never once... Harden my heart against God. I never blame God. She said, I let him heal me. And she said, when I let him heal me, I was able to overcome. But she, she said, I knew if I didn't have God, I wouldn't, I wouldn't make it. I just wouldn't make it. 
and and yet her little daughter was only 10 years old very sadly and and i know she's she's with jesus but my point is she knew she needed god and and when we harden our heart against god we don't have the rescuer we don't have you know the word says uh the lord is a high tower and when we run into that tower we are safe and there's no safety outside of god when we're grieving and we're, we're suffering in that way and of course it does say in in the bible as well it, it talks about uh jesus being a man of sorrows and you know and that he suffered himself isaiah 53 says that that he that he suffered terribly and so when we're distressed, Jesus understands. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father, and he's able to uh, give, give uh, you know, intercession on our behalf. But he is the road to safety when we are distressed. And I just want you to know that I myself have experienced tragedy with family members and things. And I, I'm like my, my sister-in-law. If I didn't have Jesus, I couldn't have made it through. And I think that's really important to realize that he is our firm foundation. He is that strong tower and he will help us. And, and, and let me tell you, after my niece was actually murdered, they, they said that they think at least 300 people came to the Lord. And part of the reason was the parents, her parents, they started witnessing about the grace of God over their tragedy and how God was helping them through that, you know, and it's, you know, it was just an amazing, courageous testimony, but it was also a testimony of how the hand of God can really help people through the most horrific things. And you could come out the other side and be strong and be, have the grace of God to help you be a testimony to others. Amen, Bernice. Yeah, amen, amen. Yeah, I mean, I was reading just a few testimonies this week, just online. You know, you don't have to search, you don't have to click very far to, to see all the all the testimonies that of, of just tragedies that people do go through and, and, and experience in life. Um, I can think just in this month alone, um, not personal tra tragedies, but but close enough to sort of stop and pause and reflect. You know, people that you were praying for where it just didn't turn out the way that you had expected things to turn out and so you know you don't have to look very far these days to actually see the grief and to see the sorrow and to see all the pain that people are having to go through on a on a day-to-day -day basis but one of the articles that I actually read there was a there was a man of God who was actually um, in response to to a woman who had um, lost her husband and her her two children in a shooting tragedy again in the United States as well and the counselor wrote this to her he said God did not reach down from heaven and decree that your husband and daughters be murdered. He wouldn't do that. The tragedy that took your family from you happened because we live in a fallen world. And in a fallen world, bad things can happen to good people. Being a Christian does not exempt you from tragedy, misfortune, grief or sorrow. When trouble rains down, it falls on the sinner and on the saint alike. But your faith gives you a way to cope with the bad things that happen in this fallen world. And it gives you hope of a future in spite of the bad things. Your life will never be restored until we stop blaming God for the loss and actually ask him or invite him in to help us. And I just thought it was just lovely the way that the author kind of put that. But there is that sense of God saying, you know, there's always a choice when grief kind of strikes or tragedy strikes strikes a family is that there's a choice then of 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 what to do and and which direction to go because like i said you know um the scripture says you know blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted but if you're not allowing your heart to be open in an invitation to the comforter you won't be comforted and so mourning can actually take you down two different paths and i was reading just the accounts i was looking at the four gospels and looking at the accounts of um, the resurrection of Jesus through all four accounts, and they're quite different. Just you see the personalities of of the disciples kind of coming through as those things were written. Um, you know, you've got a lot of information in the book of John. Um, Luke gives the description of the Emmaus Road when Jesus was res resurrected, and and that all comes through with with just lots and of information. And then you get to Mark's gospel, and it's it's pretty short the way he kind of unpacks things for for the reader but he talks about how the you know they all talk about the first appearance where um jesus appears to mary magdalene but in mark's um gospel it, it's very brief it's two verses 
um, that he talks about her encounter and then another two verses where he talks about the Emmaus Road encounter. But it says that she went and told those who had been with him. So she ran to tell the disciples and it says as they mourned and they wept. So she goes to them in their state of mourning and weeping. And when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. They did not believe. And then it goes on to the Emmaus Road encounter where the, where the two that had walked um, into the country and they went and told it to the rest. But they did not believe them either. So you have those two encounters and the disciples were in such a state of grief and weeping and mourning that they cannot actually believe the testimony that's coming up before them. And then it talks about how Jesus comes and actually meets with the disciples as they were sitting at the table. And when Jesus appears to them, it says this in verse 14 um, of, of Mark 16, it says, uh, and he he rebuked their unbelief and their hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. <laughs> he actually rebuked that. And I found that quite interesting because that's the opportunity when grief hits, they were so inconsolable in their mourning and their weeping that they could not take part of the word of God coming out of the mouth of Mary or coming out of the mouth of the other disciples. They actually couldn't believe the testimony that was coming forth because they were so caught up in their emotions. Even though Jesus had explained things that would actually unfold and would begin to um, take part, take place once he had been crucified and that he would um, be raised from the dead. They were so trapped in their grief that they couldn't receive from it. And Jesus actually walks into the room and actually rebu rebukes them. And I thought that's interesting. I thought, you know, you know, sometimes we can get so lost in the, in the emotion of things. And sometimes we actually have to just rebuke the unbelief and the doubt and actually come into that place where, where our hearts are then uh, shifting into that place where, okay, I, I realize and I recognize I had a hard heart. I wasn't receiving from the Lord. I was unable to receive from the Lord. But I'm in a place where I recognize that because um, I can't partake of his word. I'm walking in bitterness. I'm walking in anger. I'm walking in frustration. I just can't, you know, when, when, you, when those things and emotions start to constantly manifest in our lives, those are the markers that actually we haven't allowed the Lord to minister into those areas of our disappointment and our grief. And we're not able, able to actually partake of those things. And sometimes we have to rebuke those things off of our life and say, yeah, I might be feeling these things, but actually I'm still going to choose to partake of his word, that God is good, that he is a comforter, that he will shelter me, that he will um, meet me in my hour of need. And I don't have it all together and I don't have it all figured out, but I'm going to just posture myself into that into that into that mindset even um even if it's just sitting before the lord even if it's just inviting the presence of the holy spirit to just come and comfort you in that place of 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 burden so it, that's just an example which i have never really noticed before i think it's just because easter's coming up and i start to just read through the gospels and things and i've been spending quite a bit of time in the book of mark um it's one of the, it's the shorter shorter gospels um and he's just so matter of fact <laughs> with with particular things and i was quite I was like, whoa, okay, Mark, you were just straight to the point of saying you were mourning, you were weeping, and you couldn't believe. And I think some people get stuck in that. Um, and that's not a condemnation. That's just God saying, I don't want you stuck in that. I don't want you stuck in doubt and unbelief. I want you to choose me and open your heart to me so that actually I can minister to those places and break you out of those places of, of bondage. Now, it's an interesting point you bring up about Jesus coming in and rebuking. Uh, it's because I also believe it's an open door to a spirit of heaviness. Of course, it's spoke, this is spoken of in Isaiah 61, 3. And a spirit of heaviness is a spirit of heaviness. The enemy can come in. And this is what, what it actually says in, in uh, Ephesians 4, 27. We're not to give the devil any, any foothold. And when we're, when we're in this place that we're either blaming God or we're just shutting out God, it actually then opens up a vacuum for Satan to enter in and, and that spirit of heaviness to be upon you. And so it, it is something we need to, to understand. The Lord says, uh, you know, put on a garment of praise for a spirit of heaviness. Now, I don't mean to say that in a light manner. I, I do understand that you're not going to praise anybody if you lose a, a family member. I get that. But on the same token, 
uh, what he's talking about is, is actually entering into the presence of God, recognizing that God is your comfort, understanding that he's the one that can take all of that burden off of you. I mean, this is why Jesus Christ died on the cross. It's for every burden, every every sin, every sickness, every sorrow to be at that cross, put on that cross. And oftentimes we don't do that. We keep our burdens, whether it's sickness, whether it's divorce, whether it's a lost loved ones, uh, we, 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 we keep those burdens. We, you know, we don't want to bother God. We, you know, we, this is our private personal thing. And, and, you know, people can be very private about grief. You, you know, you don't want, really want to show a chink in your arm or, or that, that you're weak in any way, uh, you know, and so as a result, it is very personal. So as a, we, we then keep, those burdens we we don't open ourselves up to anyone and much less the lord and you know i was reading another interesting thing about grief you know most psychologists of today will recommend and say that you have to go through a grief process uh, you know and and so they're they're talking about you know that uh, denial and anger and uh you know depression those sorts of things and then finally acceptance and and uh, but but actually, uh, grief isn't really expressed by people. Uh, you know, it, it's it's def or, or defined by a process. If you think about a person's really intimate uh, problems, or, you know, or maybe burdens that you want to hold close because you don't want to show them to other people. When you have an intimate relationship with God. It, it really is is the thing that breaks the yoke of the enemy. It, you know, it releases a breaker anointing over, uh, you know, anything attacking you through that grief, which a spirit of heaviness will do. The enemy wants to come in like a flood unless we let God raise a standard against him. That's what the word says. The Lord is the one that raises a standard against the enemy. And, and I don't know about you, but, uh, you know, for myself, when I've lost a close family member, it is like you're kind of drowning underneath a flood. And so you need God to raise up a standard to stop all of that. And so that you have, you know, the word says again in Zechariah 3 that the Lord wants to put a fire boundary round about you. And, and further on in Job, it talks about a hedge of protection. And so these things need to be in place when your emotions are, are uh, you know, all over the place because you've been hit very hard by something that's been, you know, very sorrowful for you. So uh, not that the process isn't isn't true or, you know, or, or not. I'm sure we are going through those phases, but it's how we, we adapt and when we're aligning with God, when he releases his glory over us. And, you know, I talked about this yesterday evening, uh, Bernice, when you and I were at another meeting, and it is interesting how even vision, you know, things that that uh, dreams that we had about our future, those things we can grieve about because we don't see them coming to pass. And and I in, in Numbers uh, fourteen, you know, thirty five through forty two, it talks about Moses and Aaron being so uh, they were actually crying, they were weeping because the people. There were rebellious people that were going up to the mountain because they thought that uh, Moses and Aaron weren't taking them in into the right place. They felt that, uh, you know, where they, the promised land, Canaan, was was not right. And and so they, and, and they were even talking about stoning Moses and Aaron. And the interesting thing about that, they were grieving for the people. They were grieving for the vision. But God spoke to them through that grief because they were not only grieving because the people were behaving the way they were, they were grieving because of, uh, you know, they didn't want that vision and, uh, you know, and that, that wonderful appointed Kairos time to be discarded because that was, that was the time that they were meant to cross over to something really wonderful and something really beautiful that God was supplying for them. And they just didn't want anyone to miss it. And I think a lot of times with vision, Bernice, we, because we're tired of waiting, we're impatient with God. We don't understand the timing of God or the process of growing in God. We, we're, we're in this hope deferred state, aren't we? We're, we're, we're sorrowful. We, we grieve because we don't think the vision has come to pass. And it could be we just run ahead of God. Amen. 
Yeah, amen. I'm just reminded as I'm listening to you to you speaking about that, even um I think it's Exodus 33 where it talks about Moses as well, how um he's entering into the tent of meeting, Joshua's with him, and it says that all the people would rise in the camp and they would stand at their tents and they would watch Moses and and Joshua actually enter into the tent of meeting, but they themselves would not enter. They wouldn't actually enter enter the tent. And, and Moses goes in. It talks about how Joshua lingered at the tent. It doesn't actually tell us when when he left, which is probably why he eventually took them over into the promised land. Um, but in that encounter, you know, where, glo where, where the glory comes down, um, this is where, you know, Moses basically says to the Lord, you know, if, if your presence is not going with us, we're not going. We're, we're, we're just going to stay in the wilderness than rather go into the inheritance without your presence with us. And it just gives you those little, you know, these places in scripture just gives you the insights as to, um, you know, the likes of Moses, the likes of Aaron, the likes of Joshua, who had such a close personal intimate encounter with the living God, where they could understand his nature, they could understand his character, they could understand his goodness, and they weren't prepared to be those on the outside who were maybe more in a spectator state and not able to enter in. And I think sometimes grief can lock you in that position where you can look at the promises of God and because of disappointment and because of heartache, you never come into that place actually where you're in the presence of God. You're kind of standing at a distance and saying, God, I just, I've, I've heard these things that you're good or I heard these things on a broadcast that you're the comforter, but I'm so wounded over here that I can't actually enter into that place. And then you contrast that with Moses, who Moses had such a personal intimate encounter with the Lord that he wasn't prepared to go anywhere without the presence of God and I think we've really got to push in for that and you know we if, if we're not experiencing that in our day-to-day -day lives or the situations that we're facing you know the the grief and the sorrows and the upsets that are taking place where we're saying God you know I need your presence to go with me. I need to be in the tent of meeting. I need to be in your presence where there's fullness of joy, where God, yes, I'm feeling heavy and I'm feeling burdened, but I'm going to, I'm going to worship in, in, in whichever way, shape or form I can, I can even get the energy to be able to do that because I know that you'll, you'll honor that and you'll meet me in that place and you'll lift me up as I enter into those things. And so I do believe that we, the Lord is drawing his people and saying, don't stand on the outside, come into his presence, mm -hmm. come into that place where there can be an encounter and there can be a place of, of change and a transformation where actually he ministers to those deep places, those deep wounded places that sometimes, sometimes you don't even realize they're still there. You know, sometimes you can, you know, I've had this experience in the past where you think, oh, I'll just listen to this particular minister teaching on a particular subject. And suddenly the Lord begins to minister to you and you realize actually there's wounds there or there's um, hurts there that, that you thought you had dealt with, but you realize that actually they're still taking a hold of certain things and God will start to minister through mm -hmm. something and begin to peel back the layers. But you know, the, the the temptation there is to, when we hear it or we feel like God wants to minister to us, we want to just retreat. We want to stand back. We want to say, it's okay. I've got it all figured out. I'm independent. <laughs> I'll be fine. Don't worry about me. And actually God's saying, no, I can see that you actually can't flow in the things that I have for you, or you can't walk in the fullness of the destiny that I have for you, because there's some things that actually can't come with you. There's some baggage that has to stay behind um, from last season's journey, and you've got to get rid of those things so that you're actually free to move in a particular in a particular direction so there will be things that God brings up unannounced sometimes but it's for your benefit you know it's not because he wants to stir up the old stuff it's because he's drawing you into that place of his presence he's drawing you into that place of encounter where the cloud comes down and the glory comes down and he says okay we're going to do business over here um, and 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 from this place you come out and you're a different person Joshua obviously stayed he lingered in the presence um, for, for longer and, and we just see the impact Impact that that had on on just Joshua's personal life as he as he walked with God and so yeah. you know we, we don't want to be spectators I've, I've had this word for several years now on on the particularly over the body of Christ I don't want to say it's any particular nation but just that sense of you know let's not be a people who hold back and and say God I just don't want to go there and so I'm just going to sit on the outside and miss out because I'd rather be be on this side in my bitterness than on the inside allowing the healing to take place even if the healing is going to be messy even if there's and I think people we like things decently in order and so sometimes we 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 kind of 
you know, kick back against the messy, <laughs> the tears or the deliverances or the things that even even need to take place. But, you know, God is good and, and he'll meet you in those places and bring you right through so long as, as you, you you give him permission to do that. You know, um, I would just say, you know, don't don't kick against those things. You know, we just we like to appear like we've got it all held together. And we're all OK and we don't need any help here, Lord. And the reality is that actually we do need help. And he's more than capable of actually doing that help. So, yeah. Amen. You know, another interesting uh, thing that I, that I, the Lord has really released into my spirit and ministering to people through the years is oftentimes there's a joining of, of uh, demonic spirits that attack people that are vulnerable in grief. And, uh, you know, so there's a spirit of heaviness, there's a spirit of fear, and then there's a spirit of infirmity. And so people get fearful, you know, because of what they've been through, that they, they don't ever want it to happen again, or, or you know, or what's going to happen to them. So there's, there's an insecurity. Uh, and then also a lot of times people get sick, you know, from, from, Ill, from, feeling traumatized or being, being in a grievous state. So these are all demonic spirits and you can of course bind them, Matthew 16, 18 and 19. And you can, you can lose peace over yourself in the mighty name of Jesus, the, uh, by divine creative miracle, you can ask God to heal your emotions, to strengthen you, you know, and so, and, and really just apply the word, you know, it's very important. And also I would encourage viewers if you have your tongue language, pray in the spirit. I've recommended this a lot with people going through grief because oftentimes the Holy Spirit knows how to pray a lot better than we do. And so praying in the spirit is, is a, a really wonderful thing to be doing to help yourself heal from these scenarios. And so we have to lean on the Holy Spirit to direct our steps, you know, concerning these things. And, and you were quite right, Bernice, when you said that oftentimes we just try to hold it all together. And so we're, we're like shells, you know, we're, well, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. But yet we still haven't really allowed ourselves because we don't want to reflect on what's happened. We haven't allowed ourselves to get fully healed. Now, I'm not saying we've got to be like we're all going on a talk show and displaying everything that's gone wrong in our lives. That, that's actually just giving glory to the enemy, you know, that we're, we're not giving uh, him any glory. What we are saying is that allow the presence of God, the word of God, maybe a prayer partner, uh, you know, someone actually to stand with you through that, that those times there, you know, or your, your godly mate, you know, your, your husband or your wife, just to walk through it with you. Uh, you know, it, it, in my case, you know, I, I, my, my son was, was, was very comforting during the time that, that I lost a, my younger brother at, and very suddenly, and, you know, he was very comforting to me during that time, and he spoke the word of the Lord, he spoke words from the Bible to help me with that, so I think it's, it's really important that we remember that it is, the enemy will come in and try to keep us really in a perpetual state of suffering, whether it's fear, whether it's infirmity, or, or whether it's just plain old grief, it will keep us in a state uh, that, that we're, we're really pressed down. And, you know, the Lord wants us to go ahead and move into our destiny. If we consider, for instance, even Elijah, you know, after he had the, the great battle where the fire came down from heaven and he defeated the over 400 false prophets, uh, he was in a hope deferred state. You might say, well, what in the world was he grieving about? Well, he was grieving because he thought he was all alone and he couldn't really do the will of God. So there was, a, again, he was in a hope deferred state. And and some Bible scholars even feel that maybe he was even, even in a suicidal state, you know, and, and God sent the ravens to minister to him, but he was in a grievous, you know, sorrowful positioning until finally the Lord said to him, now it's, you know, now that you, I've ministered to, to you both physically and emotionally, and I've ministered to you, now it's time to get up and start walking in the vision again. And he was sent to do more assignments. But it's when we stay in that place, where, you know, it, because a lot of times sorrow, misery, grief can become our identities. And it's important that we don't allow that kind of thing to shape our identities, because that is not who we are. 
We cannot remain in that place. There's a time for grief. It, Ecclesiastes 3 talks about that. There's a time to mourn. There's, there, there's a, there is a time. God allows a time for that. But also we must remember there also is a time to reap. There's a time to dance. There's time that God's allotted to other things. And so we, we must uh, allow ourselves time to heal but then God is requiring us to stand and then depend upon him to strengthen us. And that's very, very important. Amen, Bernice? Amen. Yeah, that's really, really good. And even in that story of Elijah, you know, how it goes on, you know, where the ravens are feeding him and then he kind of moves location um, and eventually he gets to the place where there's the angel who's waking him up to, to feed him sort of the baked cakes and things and, um, and then he goes back to sleep and then he wakes him up again and he feeds feeds him again and then on that second time i think it's the second time but he he obviously partakes of 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 that and it sustains him for 40 days it mm -hmm. sustains him on his journey for 40 days and i think you know even looking at that story you can see that there are there are things that the lord will release in the process of grief mm -hmm. that will sustain you it'll sustain you on the journey there'll be some words that you, yeah you just need that you just need every day you need the ravens to come every day you need that daily bread um and you maybe you need a fresh word a fresh encouragement a fresh scripture something that the lord will give you on a day-to-day -day basis but there are other times where the lord actually meets you in that hour of need and he says i'm about to pour something into you that's so profound that it's going to carry you the distance of the journey and god knows how long the journey is and he says i'm not going to abandon you on the journey i'm going to make sure you have enough sustenance super supernatural Holy Spirit impartation upon your life so that you can actually go the journey. You can actually get to the to the other side of things. You can get to the place where actually he's leading you. But those things only kind of take place where we're actually saying, God, I'm not shut off to you, that we refuse to actually, um, you know, and these are just keys, you know, refusing to blame God for, for, for whatever has happened to us and actually there are many things we don't understand the side of eternity, but we cannot blame God. We have to realize it is a fallen world and tragedies happen. Um, and looking at the process of even or even coming to healing, like you were touching on earlier, that it's it's not a tick box exercise. That if I complete this 10 point program, then I'm going to be all healed and fixed and ready for for action. But actually realizing that there are going to be ups, there are going to be downs, mm -hmm. um, there are going to be hills, there are going to be valleys. But God's in both of those places, whether you're on the mountain or the valley gods god is god over mountains and the valleys and 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 look for god's purpose in the suffering look for look for opportunities in the suffering that you know i found even with my own stories you know um i lost my dad um it hasn't even been two years now but just those there's there's so many moments that i look back now and i realize god's fingerprints were we're all over the process because I look back and I see moments of hurt and pain, but I, I had encounters with God in those moments and because he, he was right there. He was saying, look at this and look at that. And so you can even have the ability to look back at the journey and realize God was with you the whole time, even though you were still trying to process it, you were still trying to make sense of things, you were still trying to come to terms with loss and emotions and all sorts of things, but actually God was there. And if you're looking for God, you'll find him. You'll, you'll find him in those moments of grief or those moments of weakness. And those moments bring you closer. They draw you into the presence of God. They draw you into the heart of God where you can really just receive. And then I think to your point where you said, you know, your, where your son was such a blessing to you that actually we don't have to do this alone, that actually we can have friends or counselors or pastors or people that actually as scripture says, you know, bear one another's burdens. And I think there's joy in that because sometimes mm -hmm. we need to lean on people and sometimes people need to lean on us in a particular season of their life and sort of understanding that actually we don't have to carry all of our burdens alone. We've got God, number one, and then he gives us friends. He gives us family. He gives us people around us that we can mm -hmm. actually um, walk the journey out with and actually process things with. And we can lean on them for a particular for a particular season. Um, you know, I know I I've been being involved in seasons where, you know, just as a prayer support, really, where it's you're just you're just there for a season. You're just there to be a support. You're there, just there to intercede. You're just there to be faithful to where God has you because you're carrying somebody else's burden. And then the, in the flip side, that they, people do that for, for you as well. So there's there's just wisdom in those things as well, that God God doesn't leave us to to our own devices, but that he wants to be part of the journey and the process. And he gives you enough to sustain you. 
He will give you, if you say, here I am, God, he says, right, here's the bread. <laughs> here's the daily bread or here's the bread that lasts you 40 days and it's supernatural. And, and you, you come out the other side with, with that testimony of God's goodness because he didn't leave you or forsake you. He actually walked it out uh, with you. Amen. Wonderful. You know, I think also it's very important that we recognize the character of God. And, and Isaiah, I think in, in Isaiah 63, 7 through 11, uh, he really describes so very well, it, especially in verse 9, uh, you know, that how God himself really relates to our pain. And he, he says in Isaiah 63, 9, he says, in all their distress, he too our Lord was distressed, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and mercy, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. Yet they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. So this talks about how the Lord knew, uh, you know, about the vulnerability of the people. And he was also grieved. So he relates to what we're going through. He understands about pain. And it says in that scripture verse that he carried them all of that time. And so I believe that uh, this is what the word talks about, that there are watchers, you know, there are angelic watchers. And I believe those are the ones that actually re report and, and, and tell the Lord what's happening on earth. And, and, you know, because God is the creator of the universe and, and uh, he, he actually, as we petition God, you see, he can release uh, ministering angels to help us. He can also uh, make uh, cause there to be a really a petitioning in the courts of heaven for release uh, from our pain. You know, if we consider Job, I mean, Job in, in the book of Job, yes, he was suffering what many believe is lep of leprosy. He was stricken with that. But also he lost his children. Uh, it's it's uh, historically is that you read in, in accounts, uh, you know, the Hebrew text. He also lost his first wife. And uh, so there are he, he lost his kingship. He was mocked by people. I mean, he was he was a king of Oz, which was a, a quite a well-known land in that time. And so he was suffering. And, and I believe that God saw his suffering. And, and God restored to him be, and, you know, and had a conversation with Job, you know, and, and of how he could re get himself back restored again. And I think it's important we recognize that God understands and he will rescue. He's the great rescuer of mankind. This is why Jesus Christ died on the cross so that we would have uh, the veil would be ripped and so that we can approach boldly approach the throne of God. And he can release things to help us through these very tough times. And so it's important that we do recognize that, that God is in control. And whatever the enemy tries to do, they are not greater than God. They are not greater than God. And also, I also I'd just like to say to you that, uh, viewers tonight, that if you have anyone that you have lost, let me tell you, God sees that pain and, and he's the restorer of the breach. Because I believe that oftentimes there's there's a vacuum when we lose people we love, you know, and we feel a bit lost at sea, you know, kind of thing. And, you know, especially when it's like, you're, uh, like I lost my mother of lung cancer. It's been more than 20 years now. But I, I you know, I, I just think when you lose a parent, you feel a bit lost at sea because they're the nurturers from the time you were born. And so there's this vacuum. But God actually fills the vacuum, you see. And, and he's the one that actually is will nurture us through that time. So it's important we recognize that he understands our pain, but also how to fix and, and nurture us through that pain over to the other side. And, uh, and we'll, you know, we, we can have a joy. This is why it says in, in the word of God, the joy of the Lord is our strength. It's not saying we're all going to be all singing, all dancing when we've lost someone. What it is saying is, God fills the broken places and moves us into a place of restoration and where we don't have to stay with that badge of, of, you know, hardship and oppression. God has never meant for us to walk through a life of suffering continually. We are meant to be overcomers. And yes, we may walk through a valley, but we're walking through the valley. We're not meant to stay there. That's not our permanent home. We have to walk through it and then let God enable us to overcome it. 
because it can be a pretty harsh mountain. And I tell you who else gets in on the act is a principality called Leviathan. Mm -hmm. And he speaks all sorts of, of deceptions to make you believe that you deserve, even deserve that pain or that you weren't a good daughter or you weren't a good mother, or you, you know, and all of these kinds of things. And we just don't need to put up with that. In the name of Jesus, we can rebuke the devourer and command him to go. And we can stand up and let the Lord raise us up, just like Elijah was raised up after he was ministered to. There's a time for mourning, but there's a time to stand. Amen, Bernice? Amen. Yeah, that's so good. And I think what you touched on there, just in terms of just, you know, allowing God to fill the vacuum is, is, is that sense that if there is a void, mm -hmm way that the realm of the spirit works is if there is a void or a vacuum something will fill it <laughs> mm -hmm. it's not going to remain empty and so as as believers we want to make sure that any vacuum any void any place of 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 where there is no occupancy um is actually occupied by the holy spirit is is, is occupied by god in those areas so we're not leaving an empty room in our heart for fear to occupy we're not leaving an empty room for uh, uh bitterness to occupy or anger or anguish to actually begin to occupy those places and and kind of invite all his friends along to the party as well and say well there's an empty room over here we can wreak havoc in the in the life of a believer um actually in those in those places when 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 we recognize them you know get those things out of our lives through the word of god through the anointing to break the yokes of the enemy and then allow the Holy Spirit to actually occupy those voids, occupy those places in our lives. You know, the word of God that can that can absolutely break the rock of, of bondage over our lives so that we're not leaving a gap for the enemy to to come in. It talks about this in 1 Peter 5. And actually, 1 Peter 5 talks a lot about the humility. Um, it talks a lot about casting your cares onto, onto God as well because he because he cares for us. And then it goes on to say, you know, be sober and alert because the enemy prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And we're called to resist him, to stand firm in the faith because we know that the family of believers throughout the world are going through the same kind of sufferings. So he touches on that there are sufferings, that there are persecutions, there are heartaches that we're going to experience but we don't want to leave that void or that vacuum for the enemy, the lion, to kind of pounce on us in our moments of vulnerability or our moments of weakness and actually relying on God's grace. Because in verse 10, it goes on to say, and the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, I love the way he puts a little while, just a little while after you have suffered, will himself restore you and make you strong and firm and steadfast to him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Just a powerful little, you know, few scriptures there. If you if you go and have a read of 1 Peter 5 um, from verse 6 to, that was just to verse 11, but just that sense of God saying, actually, there is some suffering, but we are called to be those who are standing firm. We're standing strong in the Lord. We can actually lean on him. We can depend on him. We mm -hmm. can allow him to fill fill the voids we can allow him to to minister to those those places that we're feeling weak and weary we don't have to do it alone we don't have to be self-reliant we can actually rely on on god you know there's places in the valley there's places in despair that we can actually only experience the comfort of god when we're mourning we can only experience elements of god actually through our pains and through our sufferings that we get to experience god in in those particular ways and so um even as we're walking we don't want to have this independent stance you know that's I think even that's where to your point with, with Leviathan as well there's a scripture in Job where you read about Job in um, Job 41 where it talks about how sorrow dances before him sorrow actually dances before Leviathan and I think sometimes again we can just read these things and not pay much attention to them but actually if we've postured ourselves where we're, we're in that vacuum. We don't need anyone. We're just going to push through. We're going to be okay. We don't need help. We don't need God. Um, we, we start to, 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 to linger in that sorrow. It can be that open door for pride. 
It can be an open door because we're relying on self to get us through. And that's where Leviathan actually can enter the fold and wreak havoc on the lives of the believer. And I don't believe God wants us in those places. God wants us to have the breakthrough. He wants to walk with us in the valleys. He wants us to walk in a breaker anointing um, in, a, in, a, in all of our lives. And, and I think, you, you know, you, you, you see the compassion of God in scripture. We see the compassion of Jesus, even where in scripture he talks about, um, we, we see those instances where he wept. You know, Jesus wept. He kind of he, he met people in in that in that place of 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 weeping. The first one was in um, John eleven, I think it is, with 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 Lazarus. Um, depending on which way you read it, I've always, you know, some people say, well, he was weeping for Lazarus. I've often thought maybe Jesus was weeping over the unbelief of Mary and Martha <laughs> because he knew that he was going to go and raise Lazarus from the dead, um, you know, and so it would be strange to be weeping, but perhaps just moved by their compassion. But you see that sense of Jesus, actually his humanity and actually weeping with us um, for the things that we're experiencing, the things that Martha and Mary and, and the friends were experiencing at the loss of, of Lazarus. Mm -hmm. And then he weeps over Jerusalem. Jesus actually mm -hmm. weeps over, over Jerusalem as well. And, you know, he's weeping over them because he knew what was coming. He knew that they didn't, again, they didn't recognize their hour of encounter. They didn't recognize the word that was made manifest amongst them. And so there would be things that actually had to happen to Jerusalem that continue even probably up to this day, but Jesus is weeping over them. He, he just, you know, he doesn't want them to go through those trials. He doesn't want them to go through those tribulations, but actually they will because they couldn't receive from him. They were closed off to him. They couldn't accept him as the Messiah. They couldn't accept him um, for, for who he said he was. And so you see that as well in scripture, which again, just should touch our hearts really, just to see the humanity of, of God sending Jesus, coming down, putting on flesh, and then having to go through all of these things so that actually we would have a hope at the end of the day. We could be comforted. We could be encouraged. We could allow Holy Spirit to fill those voids and those vacuums uh, in our lives. Amen. You know, there are a lot of people that are under a spirit of heaviness uh, because of um, past abuse situations, maybe trauma they encountered absolute years ago. And, and so they're, they're, they're depressed. They're, they're uh, not uh, able to really come out of, of that place of, of oppression. And, and I'm not saying that, that hormones don't have a, you know, there, there are some physiological things that come into some of those symptoms. But what I will say to you is that uh, there is a, a level of sin and wickedness that does release, uh, you know, darkness in our time uh, that, that causes people to be, if they're not spiritually staying in the presence of God, the word of God, to be uh, opposed by the enemy and oppressed by the enemy. And uh, especially, I would say, prophetic people are people that are called to the prophetic. I, I, I say often that prophetic people are very, very sensitive people. We we have to be, you see, in order to hear God and to move in the character of God. So we carry his glory. So there's a sensitivity that we have. And so and sometimes it can be overwhelming when there's there's a, a lot of wickedness in the, the society that God's appointed you. You know, as far as, uh, you know, in the UK alone, there's there's so much witchcraft that goes forth. And and if you are prophetic or you have, uh, you know, you have a sensitivity in the spirit where, you know, you you move in words of knowledge or, you know, that sort of thing, it, it may very well affect you. And so there are things you must do, uh, you know, in order to make sure that that you are protected. And I would say applying the word is very important. And I was just teaching last night about taking charge of, of you know the, the the day that you're living in the time that you're living in and especially if you read psalm 91 it talks about how you can take charge of the night hours and 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 so there are psalms that are attached you see uh to you know that that we can actually to uh uh, we can we can speak forwards or forth our circumstances that are very powerful. And three that I found very helpful is is Psalm 57, Psalm 35, and Psalm 91. And it, because it talks about really restraining 
uh, manipulations of the enemy and declaring that God will push back the enemy into his own net and he will comfort us and he will send angels to, to chase the enemy away. So these things are very important. You know, Psalm 57 talks about awakening the dawn, uh, you know, and, and taking charge of the day in the mighty name of, of Jesus. We need to do that. So we need to apply the word and recognize that where we're appointed sometimes has a heavy degree of wickedness. And we need to cover ourselves with the blood of Jesus by applying his word, by speaking forth and decreeing. Because the word says, the Bible says that when we resist Satan, he has to flee. And of course, he can't stand up. He can't oppose the word of God. So it's important that we utilize it as a as a sword, you know, sword of the spirit to slay the enemy and command him to go the other direction. So that's very important that we also don't always think that there's something wrong with us. It very much might be opposition because you're in a location where the enemy is opposing many, many people and you're sensitive to it. So you you can you can actually come right out of that place into a place of victory as you start applying the word. So start thinking about that. Because I think sometimes, Bernice, what we do is we think, well, I'm just depressed all the time. This is just how I am. And we we, de we de declare these things over ourselves when that's not, you know, necessarily the case. It could be that it's a problem you have to overcome, or it could be something that you're very influenced by the environment you're living in. So I think it's important we we really have a self-awareness of these things. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I think there is that. You, you just understand. Under, I think so often we just we like you say you, we sort of we we call out things over ourselves and we kind of just label ourselves those those things, um, and then the enemy pounces on them and says, "Well, she's already called herself that, so I'm just going to capitalize on that as well and just and just go with it." So we've got to be really careful of those things as well, um, and particularly like you were touching on, particularly if you're prophetic or you you're a bit of a feeler in the realm of the spirit where you've got a real sensitivity to things where you can be sensing and feeling things and actually um, taking things on board. Um, one passage of scripture that comes to mind actually is in the book of Nehemiah, um, right up at the beginning, I think it's chapter one or chapter two, where Nehemiah um, is confronted by the king and the king says to him, you know, why are you why are you so sorrowful? Why are you so full of sorrow? You're not sick. Um, and this was actually a sorrow that God was allowing to come upon Nehemiah for him to be able, for that to be the catalyst for him to be able to go and rebuild Jerusalem, to go and rebuild the walls and the gates, etc. And so even sometimes, you know, you can have a sensitivity about things and you can start to own it and think, well, it's just my sorrow. Nehemiah could have got stuck in that place of sorrow and thought, well, I'm just sorrowful. I'm just depressed. I don't know what to do with myself he could have just stayed in that location and and, and talked himself into us into a particular state but actually when you recognize the emotion of sorrow it's important to even inquire of the lord god why am i feeling like this why is there is it related to me or personal circumstances or is there something that i'm sensing a sorrow often he does this with prophetic people you know you can have a you can feel the sorrow of god over a particular nation you can have a sorrow of god over a particular people group because he's burdening you to come into a place of intercession or into a place of, of of a prophetic act or to do something he doesn't want you to to partner with the sorrow he wants the sorrow to be the the thing that actually says ah oh, god is trying to show me something he's got a he's got some, a plan he's got something that he wants me to partner with him and the spirit of god wants us to partner with him here on earth so that his will can be released into a particular into a particular environment or into a particular situation. So, so, and, and, and so often we can just get trapped in that cycle. We can get trapped in a grief mentality, a depressed mentality, an anxious mentality, but actually why am I, the why is quite important. The, the enemy doesn't want us to ask why, <laughs> why am I feeling like that? Or why am I sensing that? Um, mm -hmm. What is this thing that's agitating me? Or what is this thing that's stirring me in a particular emotion? Um, especially when you know it's not you, it's not your personal circumstances. Mm -hmm. It could just be God allowing you to feel his heart over something, feeling his heart over, over a generation. And prophetic people will, and intercessors will, will feel this a lot. You will 
will just you will be burdened by the Lord over particular things. And it can be quite overwhelming. Um, you know, the first few times, I, you know, it happening to me, I, I would just I would just weep. I was like, you know, particularly for, for my local town where I was, I thought eventually I would just walk around thinking, Lord, I'm weeping for a people I do not know. <laughs> that, was, that was what was coming out of my mouth. Oh, Lord, I'm just I'm weeping for a people I do not know. And yet I'm so burdened to pray for them. I'm so burdened to intercede for just the geographical location where I was at. And God doesn't keep you in extended periods of that as well. I think that's important where he's saying, you know, you don't, you're not the fullness of the rescue mission. He will lead you into those seasons of mourning. He'll lead you into those seasons of groanings, but then he'll bring you out of them and he will He will bring you into a season of joy and a season of restoration. And then after another time, he'll say, okay, we're going to go again. And this is you know, how you're going to pray or this is how you're going to posture yourself. So again, just learning the cues of the Holy Spirit really and being led by the Spirit into those things and recognizing and owning, this is mine, this is not mine, this is from the Lord yeah. or this is from the enemy and actually just figuring out what is the source of that sorrow what is the source of that grief what is that source of the emotion and once you identify the source then start to re recognize how it should be dealt with you know if it's something the enemy's trying to put on me then you know i'm going to war with that with the word of god and through the power of god um you know if it's if if the leviathan was coming at me i think the best best trick against Leviathan is humility. <laughs> God, I am weak. God, will you fight this battle for me? Um, mm -hmm. Humility against the, the one who is over pride, I think, is a, is a good strategy with Leviathan. But that's just an example where we can say, God, I, you know, where's this coming from? And then how do I deal with it? And he will show you how to deal with those things. But Nehemiah is a good one, you know, in terms of building, because Nehemiah got a lot done in a short space of time. He did things that mm -hmm. other people couldn't do and had maybe planned to do, but because he was so driven, he was so um, anointed of God for that particular assignment. You just see the favor that he had, favor with the people to be able to accomplish just the just the miraculous in the spite of the enemy tactics of intimidation and that sort of thing. So, you know, that's a good example of, of, of sorrow that God used actually for the benefit of building up a, a nation. Well, and it can be a driver. That's the thing about it, uh, you know, it can be a driver, and this is the case with Nehemiah, because he had such a burden for his people, you know, and he was so grieved, you know, God put him in a very favorable position. I mean, he must have been at some point just be going, going, woohoo, you know, I've got the lumber, I've got the contract, you know, I've got everything I need, we're going, you know, because, you know, on the other side of, of actual misery and suffering is great joy you know we we have great capacity to feel emotions and i can tell you it's a great relief when we've come through that valley because where we you know valleys are at the base of mountaintops and we can go up to the mountaintop after we've been through that valley and also the wonderful thing about god is what you know joseph said this to his brothers after all he had suffered you know enslavement and and prison and all that he had suffered, he said to them, you know what, the enemy is meant for evil. God has turned it around for good. And I, I think we can't see that. You know, when we're in the midst of our suffering, we cannot see that. But I found through, through my suffering with my own family members, I have found that God has used that to help me help others. And and also he's made me a deeper person because I, I've experienced pain I can understand the pain and connect with others that are going through that same pain. And so uh, we'll be stronger for it because the Lord says, love thy neighbor. You know, he says that we're, we're meant to really love each other with an unconditional love. And it teaches us how to do that, you know, when, when we have gone through suffering. And, you know, and I, I think tonight I, I feel very led to pray for people that are even in a, a suicidal positioning because of a, a long-term assignation, shall we say, with grief. And, and the Lord doesn't want you to be walking in that for, for a long-term period of time. That's not the allotted time that God has for you. And I, I heard the Lord say that there's some that are either watching now or will be watching on a replay that you've looked at your life and you've considered yourself a failure and you felt even abandoned by those that, that have either died or, or uh, 
you know, left you or been separated from you for some reason. And it, it's, it, you just feel like life's had, you know, not been good to you. And so this is a, a route that you want to go. But I hear, heard the spirit of the Lord say, this is not of him. You've, you've made an ethnic nation. You've opened the door for the enemy, Satan, to speak words to end your life. But the Lord says, I've called you for purpose. I've called you to be one that's not meant to be in a long-term place of sorrow. The Lord says, I will turn this sorrow into joy if you allow me to do that tonight or any time that you're watching this broadcast. The Lord says, I will restore you, but you must allow me to come through the door. You must lock the door to Satan tonight and open the door to me. And the Lord says, I will embrace you. I will stroke your head and tell you how precious you are to me. And I heard the Lord say even this, and I will kiss your brow because the Lord says, you are my beloved. You are my beloved. And the Lord says that will never change. And if you give your heart to me, I will restore you and give you life. Praise be to God. Let us pray. Father, in Jesus name, pray with me if that's you. In Jesus name, Lord, I accept you, Father God. I accept you, Father God, for every single thing that has hurt me and caused me pain and suffering. Lord, I, I commit that to you in the name of Jesus. I put that at your cross. I put that at the cross of Jesus. And I ask, Father God, that you would restore me. And Lord, I thank you that I am your son and daughter as, you, as Jesus comes into my heart and renews me that all bitterness and anger and pain is going right now. And I am your beloved Father God. I am your beloved Father God. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Bernice, would you like to release anything further tonight? Amen. Yeah, I just began to see, I saw it actually like a cloth, um, but it was all tied up in a, in, in a knot. Um, and I just had the sense of the Lord saying, he, he, he's untying things, he's loosening mm -hmm. things. Um, it, it, it's, it's caused you even stomach issues and health issues as well, where there are certain situations that just put you into a place where you just feel completely tied up um, by the enemy and tied up and not really sure which direction to go. It actually kind of paralyzes you in a sense because you feel like you can't move forward. Um, and so Father, I just thank you, Lord, that those who felt like even their stomach is in knots, Lord, mm -hmm. where they're in knots on the inside, God, mm -hmm. that you would just touch those places, that you would begin to um, remove those knots, that you'd begin to untie those knots that actually hold your people in a place of captivity, that mm -hmm. hold them in a place of bondage, Father. I just break on this broadcast mm -hmm. tonight, Lord, and bind mm -hmm. up all shame, God, mm -hmm. all guilt that people are feeling over certain mm -hmm. things where they feel guilted into particular scenarios mm -hmm. and, and guilted into, into, into how they should feel or, or, or constantly Constantly just just feeling like they're condemned father we know that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus and so Lord we release them from that condemnation tonight Lord that you would break every chain I break and I bind up the spirit of Belial those that where he's made you feel worthless in the in, in areas where there has been loss and there has been lack and there has been devastation where the enemy has come in and I saw him come in like he just plowed the field and he just he just called a, a, a devastation even to the harvest mm. it was like a devastation of harvest where where you had it, it just seemed everything was blooming everything was blossoming everything was kind of co going according to plan and then suddenly the enemy turned up in the field and just shattered your dreams and shattered your promises I just declare a new day dawning I just mm. declare Lord that though there is still life in the stump Lord that these things will now spring forth that there is mm. life in the stump it says that in Isaiah 6 there is still life in the stump though it's cut down it will spring back to life and I just speak restoration over the things that were lost restoration over the fields that were taken father I thank you that you are the same God today take that word I released it at the beginning today if you hear his voice don't harden your heart mm -hmm. I declare that it is today today that you get here today that you get restored today that you get delivered today that you have an encounter with the living God because he wants to meet with you father yeah. I just 
thank you for these ones. I saw someone else, I saw it like your heart and I saw lacerations in the heart. And the Lord says, I'm binding up the wounds of the broken hearted, that there are deep wounds, deep lacerations, even deep cuts into, into the heart as well, that the Lord, you're going to feel like a warmth, like a warm liquid actually coming mm -hmm. over your chest area now as I'm even speaking. And the Lord says, I'm ministering to those places. I'm binding up your wounds so that you're not going to forget that you're not going to have, a, a, you know, you're not, you're, he's not going to wipe your memory, but you're not going to carry that same pain that was associated with mm -hmm. those particular memories. And then just lastly, I saw I saw someone and you were walking down. It felt like a corridor or like an alleyway or a pathway. And it was just so dark. And you were just walking and walking and walking and walking. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly I saw that there was a there was a corner. And I heard the spirit of the Lord say, you're about to turn the corner. You're about to turn yeah, the corner. Yeah. You've been going down that pathway thinking mm -hmm. you're alone, thinking God doesn't see yeah. you, God doesn't hear you. You feel like you're walking in darkness. You're about to turn the corner. And when you turn that corner, there's I see an angelic presence. There's going to be such light yeah. that covers you and comes upon your life that actually people are going to turn around to you and say, you don't look like the same person I saw yesterday. What mm -hmm. happened to you? God is about to encounter you. You're about to turn the court in that. You're about to have that angelic visitation. Send the angels, God. Send the angels, Lord, to hearken to these words, Lord, to minister to your people, to bring them to pass, Lord. We thank you for those, Lord. We thank you for healthy emotions, God. We thank you for your word that we can process emotions and feelings and know which direction to go. And I thank you, Lord, that even during the week, God, you would just give people the bread that they need to sustain them for whatever season they are walking in. Amen. Amen. Turning the corner for that Nehemiah woohoo moment. Yeah, <laughs> amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. God is good. All the time he's good. We trust in him. We lean not into our own understanding, but we trust in him and he will restore us. And he'll, well, yea, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we shall fear no evil for the Lord our God is with us. Hallelujah. Thank you for joining us this evening. We pray that this is ministered to you. It certainly has come from the heart and certainly from the word of God. And I know that, that God's word it will uh, being applied tonight will absolutely bring his restoration power unto you. Hallelujah. So thank you so much. If you need further prayer, please do email tlpropheticministry at outlook.com. We do have Zoom prayer teams that will be happy to pray with you and bless you. And again, we have a, a, a week uh, full of uh, programming here at Torchlighters TV, but we are uh, Torchlight, the Torchlighters family will be going into a fast on Friday and Saturday, just praying for our nation. And I'd like to just round up by praying for uh, Princess Kate uh, with her recent diagnosis of cancer. And I just feel very led to just come into prayer for this, this wonderful young woman in Jesus name. So Father, we lift up uh, Princess Kate, Father God, in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, whatever uh, heaviness her family is feeling at the moment, Father God, uh, whatever fear she is feeling at the moment, Father God, Lord, we, we just bind those things in Jesus' name. And Lord, I, I thank you, Father God, that, that your word is yes and amen. And Lord, we just supply your word. And Father, we ask in the name of Jesus that you would uh, remove all infirmity from her. And Lord, that, that you would bring her into a place, Father God, that she knows you as, as her rock of salvation. That, Father God, that her eyes are open to truth. And, Father God, that she would enter into comfort and peace and strength, Father God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, send ministering angels round about her, Father God, and that of her father-in-law, King Charles, Father God, that they are both ministered to and blessed, Father God, in the name of Jesus, and set free from every spirit of infirmity and sorrow and heaviness. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. We thank you, Father. We give you praise. Again, thank you for joining us. And thank you for joining us in that prayer for uh, King Charles and also Princess Kate. God is, is sovereign. He is great. And he is well able to heal uh, and bring his miraculous power to comfort. Take hold of that comfort tonight in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you. This is Lisa and Bernice signing off and blessing you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We will see you very soon and have a great and wonderful and happy Easter in Jesus name. Bye bye.